was very lucky to meet Artun Sena, and even luckier to get to know him. After all, I was one of many people making documentary films about Formula One racing, and he was a world champion. These numbers tell the story of a career. This film tells the story of a man. In between seasons, Artin always went back to Brazil to unwind, only returning to test the next year's car. How is it returning to the racing car for such a long absence? Well, it's nice, first of all, to see number one on the nose of your car. That is really a great feeling. It's the second time I experienced that, and I hope I will have a few other times. I wondered if at this stage in his career, he felt that he had anything to prove. In the end, what matters is to do it the way you like to do, the way you believe is right. And you have to be positive, you have to be strong, psychologically speaking. Very, very tough, very, very strong to go through the doubts and the uh, knockdowns and the um, and, uh, kind of war that goes on sometimes to be tough and go through it and make sure you get to the other end of the tunnel. Art and Senna was not one of the boys. In a group photograph, he can't seem to get away soon enough. This attitude led to the perception that he was arrogant, but this was simply because of his exceptional dedication to the matter in hand. There has never been a more focused driver than Art and Senna. On Artin's visit to the factory after a winter break in Brazil, he wanted to see the new car that could carry him to another world championship. How carefully he touches it. He was always thoughtful, as can be seen from his reflection about the best qualifying strategy. Depends on the, each, each event, on, the, on what situation you find yourself. What are your difficulties? What are your strengths at each Grand Prix, technically speaking, relatively not only to your car but to other people? Then you have to 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 play the game as it comes to you, as it presents to you. He tried to get the maximum out of any situation, even at a test interrupted by bad weather. As the track dried up. He checked its condition in a borrowed Porsche. He was determined to use all the available time for developing the car and suggested moving the track workers' lunch break. Some places are dry, but uh, here on the street, it's quite damp still at the end of the street. Can, can they stop 11.30? Maybe? 11.30 to 12.30? Yeah, it's very, very difficult. I think. Yeah? Even for 12 is difficult, but 11.30 is very, very difficult. Uh -huh. Is it dry enough that you could just get a run so we could check the fuel pumps out, get that pressure ready? Oh yeah, sure, sure, we can do that. And then stop. Drop. Later, on a break, while the track was still drying, someone brought a small road car with a new engine that fascinated the mechanics. Artem was interested too, but he couldn't wait to get back to work. Time to work! Come on! Outsiders may have found him distant, even unfriendly, but he was always very amiable with me, even after a long overnight flight in his private jet back from his winter break. But I'm looking forward much more than I was a year ago. Uh, I had the opportunity to relax, cool down, restart, and uh, get ready in the best shape as possible for this 91 season. So. We we'll wait and see. At a formal dinner, I could see that he wanted to hear the speakers, but he good naturedly put up with the attention of his fans. It's always important to understand people. Okay? To Dubai? Dubai. <laughs> because if you are able to establish a good understanding relationship, uh, you can evaluate better the situations you, are, you get faced to during the stress and during the pressure. At the beginning of one season, a new co-driver arrived at a Silverstone test with zero experience of Formula One and no knowledge of the circuits. Andretti had to get used to the new paddle shifters. And, uh, one, 
one good thing about it, you just keep your eyes on the road. Yeah. You don't yeah. look. But Artin was very sympathetic to the learning curve ahead of him. I think he has a tremendous challenge in front of him. Uh, with the limit time in practice, uh, still learning about the car and uh, totally new circuit, it'll be difficult for him. But Senna did his best to help, showing him lines and braking points. If my car last year was, but I think this car will be better yeah. because it's a better car. How do you enter here? This is the one uh, over here. And here. Uh, you aim for here. Yeah. Break straight. straight. Okay. Aim to that angle there and then back. So you downshift? Yeah, you downshift there. If you stop a moment. Yeah. You downshift there, going to that uh, edge of the yeah. curb. Clearly the most important relationship in Artin's Formula One world was with McLaren's Ron Dennis. He's very ambitious man, and I like that. He works very hard for the team and uh, to the success. And um, he's a very clever man. And uh, I'm saying all that because I really do believe in everything. and. Uh, and I am probably one of his biggest fans. Although we have our difference, sometimes I, I respect him a lot. Ron Dennis was able to sum up his star driver in three words. Simply the best. Beneath the soft-spoken exterior, there was certainly passion. So much determ determination, so much strength. Uh, you just go. And there is, uh, it's very little to stop you. You just commit to it, and you and you you may see things that drivers that are not to that level cannot see, or take a little longer to realize. Was this arrogance? No, he was his own harshest critic. And suddenly, boom! Everything goes away. Nothing. You end up with nothing. And that race, and it's frustrating because. Um, it was a hard weekend anyway, it was a hard race. I had done almost a two hour race at that stage. I had some technical problems, which I believe I could have control until the end. But I, in some ways I allow myself to be caught once more. And from the frustration and the anger is after, immediately after, I, I just use it, use it for the next one and get it right the next one, learn from that one a lesson and um, try to avoid the next time. Will not catch me again. None of this means that he didn't get any fun out of racing, as you can see when he drove the car for the first time after his winter break in Brazil. Everything happens very, very fast in a Formula One car. And when you drive only road cars for three months, as powerful as they can be, it's a huge difference. And you only really realize when you actually drive it again, even if you have driven for many years from low one cars. Uh, it's really something when you actually do it. Motor racing is dangerous, and only the foolhardy never think about it. When you're driving, you are risking. There's no difference, of course. If a dr some drivers have accident every time they drive is because they are doing it wrong. They are taking the risks, but they are taking the wrong risks. So when you are driving, you are risking, and you have to judge the risks you take. I wondered just how seriously he took the danger. It's very strong in my mind, and it's um, it's very good that he's there, the way it is, because um, it, it gives you the right feeling for self-preservation. At moments when you are dealing with a danger very near, in a way that uh, it's a very close relationship, uh, it's attractive. And being attractive, it could go a little bit too much at certain moments. And the uh, fact that you, you, you are aware of it, that you can be hurt or you can die, uh, gives you the ability of stopping at some moments uh, where you really have to stop. And um, it's there, but I live with it very well. 
and um, uh, it's something that um, I use as a self-preservation feeling more than anything. Martin was in a number of my films and he was always very friendly. But I was surprised when he called me one day, quite out of the blue, and asked me if I'd like to go to Brazil and collaborate with him on a film about his life there. Well, who wouldn't? But I had one caveat. I said, you're a very quiet person and I'm very noisy and outgoing and I can't alter my personality just to fit in with you. I heard a laugh at the other end of the phone and he said, don't worry, I can handle you. Here is the film we made. Artin Senna is 31 years old. He is a professional racing driver. He has twice been world champion, and he may be the greatest racing driver of all time. His extraordinary life divides neatly into two halves. The working half is spent among the pressures and turmoil of racing and developing the car. The other half of Ayrton's life is spent in his home country, in Brazil, in circumstances which can only be described as idyllic. You don't get to be a world champion by chance, and Ayrton is a man of extraordinary singleness of purpose. Even while staying at his beach house, he's in training for the other, working half of his life, with a thoroughness which is characteristic of everything that he does. This pair of tennis shoes have done probably, they are only about over two months old. Almost finished. A lot of running. I've been doing, I've been doing 12, 15, 20 kilometers a day. Three days, one day stop, three days, one day stop. Behind it, the motivation is that I know not only for my profession is important, but also for my health. It's a responsibility I have even if I am on holiday, that I must keep uh, very close and very much under control because uh, it will make a difference when I go back to the racing car, to the tracks, and testing or racing, uh, I'll be in a better shape, I'll drive better, uh, I'll perform better. Sometimes Ayrton runs on the beach, but today he's heading for a less glamorous location, an oil jetty about a mile offshore from his home. This is not a man who runs at random, as little or as much as he feels like. He runs to a planned pattern, and it helps to know just how far he's running. Conveniently, the oil jetty is exactly one and a half kilometers long. Are you competitive by nature? You seem to me to be very easygoing, very charming. Do you save it entirely uh -huh. for racing? If I'm on holiday, off-season, um, it's a different way of living, totally, than when you do interviews, when you're testing during the season, racing, competing during the season. You have to allow yourself um, a different mental approach, a different way of looking the day. And night, and and only that way I find possible to get the necessary equilibrium to then give everything I have when it really matters. But in in normal things, I am competitive. I like to compete, and I like to 
to do well, I like to be the best. The running may be finished, but the boat ride back to the beach is nothing more than a pause in the exercise routine. You can drive a Grand Prix car, whether you are fit or unfit, but for how long you can drive, how precise, how consistent you can drive under stress, under high temperatures, under difficult conditions in, during race is another thing. You know that's going to be tough, you're going to feel tired, you're going to have some pain, you're going to lose a lot of liquid, but you know you can do it as good as anybody, if not better, if you are well trained, well fit. So if you are not fit, your concentration just tends to go gradually away during a race distance. Let's take a look at a typical day in his working life. It starts around 6.30 in the morning when he leaves his hotel. Astonishingly, he drives himself to the circuit and has to find his own way there. Ayrton's work for the day usually consists of setting up the car for its best performance for each circuit and its weather conditions. This means lapping the track many times, returning to the garage for discussions, and then lapping the track again. You have plenty of time to do all the, the work that you have to. And uh, you can think more, you can go through things methodically and learn. And uh, I like always to learn a bit more. <laughs> and at the end of a very long day, you're quite likely to find him still at the circuit. In this case, trying to improve the fit of his helmet. This is just testing. In a race for two hours, drivers are subjected to 5G in braking, 3G on acceleration, and 4G in the corners, so that a driver's head has a sudden increase in weight to about 50 pounds. Imagine the impact of that on the And you can see why this unrelenting effort is necessary. But while Arton works out so relentlessly, his friends just do their thing. By the time he's finished exercising, Arton has worked up a healthy appetite. Arton, can you eat what you like? Pretty much. Not only what I like, but as much as I like to, as much as I want to. Um, I don't normally have a problem with uh, any kind of food. Of course, I try to eat um, healthy food. I love fruits in general. I like um, also typical Brazilian type of food like rice, beans, uh, potatoes, salad. Um, but uh, I avoid red meat now for a few years. I cut it slowly. But when I'm in Brazil, I eat a little bit from time to time. I eat a lot of fish, particularly when I am in the beach house. It's very nice having your own helicopter if you want to show people around your hometown. Arton's hometown is the world's second largest city, São Paulo, the commercial capital of Brazil. This is the center, the business center of São Paulo. The big avenue with all the banks and everything. All the and, big, uh, big, you know, the center, the big center. Lots of things going on. Protect our water look at home. This is Praça da Sé. It's the beginning of São Paulo. It's the Marco Zero. So tell me, what is this building, Arton? It's my new office. It's going to be my new office. And the top of it is especially being built for a helicopter landing pad for us. We have three levels of the building just for my our activities. 
here is, is where I keep my, my private jet, which I fly all over the world. Uh, it's a twin jet. It's a HS-125-800, made by British Airspace. My design leader is where I keep my jet. Now we're coming up to the surface, Interlagos. Where we come now to race the Brazilian Grand Prix. It has gone through major rebuilding last year. And we had the Grand Prix back in Sao Paulo, before it used to be Rio. Now it's just, as you can see, some, still, some work still going on, just before we the race uh, in March. Beside the racing circuit, there is the go-kart circuit, which is where I start racing 15 years ago. That's the go-kart circuit there, beside the main straight. Back in 73, I did my first official race, which I won. I actually won the race. The circuit is over there, on our left, where I used to run. But I do my training. It's a university area. It's only for the students. And they have this club for exercise and, and fun and, 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 and all kinds of sports, activities. And uh, it's a place for only young people. It's good atmosphere, good mind, which is important, especially when you're doing hard, hard training, to have a good atmosphere, a good... Uh, positive attitude towards to your exercise, your training program. In the suburbs, Artan showed us his parents' house, where he's lived for 15 years. We built the house from zero. Your people in Sao Paulo know you live here? Some, some. And now if he goes away, you see the mountain. São Paulo may be a big and important city, but like the rest of Brazil, it's remote from Europe, the home of Grand Prix racing, and little known to people outside South America. So why has Brazil produced such successful racing drivers? I believe when somebody 10, 12,000 kilometers away decides to go to Europe from South America, from Brazil, um, you, you must have in yourself a lot of guts. We have to create much more. We have to innovate much more from our own source. We are still very young. We are still disorganized, generally speaking. And therefore we have much more problems to do things and to achieve things. And when we decide to go for it and compete, we have our, in our instincts I think a little bit more power uh, to go through difficulties and to create a little bit more in, in situations where it is the ability you have to imagine and create and put it in, in reality. Maybe we have a little bit more. Racing drivers really are very different from the way the public imagines them. Artan does not drive a tire-burning supercar, but a practical Teutonic station wagon. When he's not at his beach house, Artan spends time on his country estate, a hundred miles from São Paulo. This is a totally different environment from the beach house, but in its own way, as carefree. Were these lakes here before? There were originally two lakes. This one was the higher one. Um, and we decided to join them. And we made one big lake, which is over one kilometer long. The water is a natural water, it's spring water. There is no outside water, it's completely clean. So it's, it's beautiful to water ski, jet ski, swim, and just play water sports, which I love. And we also are planning to put some fish here. 15, 20,000, uh, to then be able to also to fish a little bit and have a fresh fish, the ones we like most, and uh, have fun. Now, over here, what are these buildings I see here? Well, they 
they were not in the farm when we bought and then part of our developing program we decided to build those those houses for the workers and so we have built so far about 10 houses and the people who then work for us can have a good way of life uh, and also uh, it's it's nice to see new things done properly with the right shape right design right style we are also making uh, the main house for us is gonna have 10 suites they'll be facing the lakes and we have a swimming pool down here and then we have the main house which is automatically connect with the suites over there with the saloons and and all the all the the other things that we we like to have in a private house we've been working here for a year and a half already and i believe we have another two years to go um, everything is facing uh, the two lakes uh, so all the time our view will be the two lakes, we have a tennis court right in front, the swimming pool, we have the boathouse there on the left, and, uh, and we try to preserve the, the, the trees that were here from the beginning, to have uh, the atmosphere, the environment as untouchable as possible. So it's going to be nice when it's finished. This is our pier that we will link the house. We have stairs going up there uh, that go on the terrace and that house is the boat house where we have the entrance. The water will go actually goes into the house so the boat go into the house, the jet skis and we have a crane there to put the jet ski out of the water and put it over a, a special place. I have there also a place for the go-karts, a place for the boat, a place for the radio control model aircraft so it's a place only for fun all the hobbies i like to play all the time and i can play here in the farm in many different ways uh, are all concentrating there so um, i will be spending a lot of my time there with my friends and my cousin and the people who like the same hobbies just as he was concerned that his house would not spoil the trees around it Arton is determined that the estate will grow its own healthy food. You've got a lot of stuff growing here, Arton. Yeah, this is just a small corn plantation that we have for our own need, for our own consumption. And uh, we use not only for us to eat, but also for the cows. You can see here, it's still premature, but... Uh, it's uh, our own corn with no chemicals or anything else that can be bad for your health. See here, mm. the corn, right? That's <laughs> terrific. It's natural, no chemicals. So. Okay, here we are with the uh, orange trees, one year old orange tree, and you can see it's still very green, it's not the the season but it's full of fruits already and again it's our own you can come and grab from here and eat immediately uh, with no chemicals or anything else this is just for everybody on the estate yes it's just for our own use uh, for my family my friends and also the people who live here in the farm we have oranges we have tangerines we have lemons we have bananas over there we have the corn, we have rice, we have lots of fruits, and uh, it's only for our own consumption. Why are you pulling this poor tree out? Because it's mandioc tree, and it's the way to get the stuff out, so you can have a nice and fresh vegetable. Okay, this is it. Here is the mandioc, all the way. And you, you, but you, now you've destroyed the tree. How long before you get any more manioc? It's about six months you get a new one. It grows very fast and is, is the way to have this agriculture. Oh. <laughs> Ayton's father is a shy man and he didn't like being seen in the film. 
You got him. Yes, we got him. But tell me what you think you got from your family and your upbringing. I think, first of all, a lot of love. I think this is important in human, human being. And um, I happened to have a lot when I was a kid from my family, and uh, that gave me all the strength I have in my education, my personality. Um, of course, I had all the support from my family in everything I, I've been involved. I've been always followed very close by my parents, particularly. And although I had freedom to choose things, anytime, whenever I, I was going out of line of what is a healthy and a good way to live, they were right there to, to show me, to explain me what was going on and what was going to happen later, which then you have no idea. And they were trying to prevent major disasters, let's say. And yet, I was able to, to do wrong things and learn by doing it, which is sometimes the best way of learning, by mistaking yourself. And I think I'm very fortunate because um, my father and mother gave me the fundamental feelings that uh, I have until today. Uh, together with that, of course, um, I have a, a wonderful sister and a very special brother. And um, we always live very close together, always doing things together, always thinking as a group, as a whole, always being positive about things. We always had a healthy life. We always had um, anything we want in life. Um, so in that aspect, I think I had um, I'm a fortune guy. The ambiance on Artem's estate is a curious combination of the glamorous and the ordinary. People arrive in private airplanes as casually as they might arrive by bus. There are always children around with lots of different gadgets to amuse them. Some of these people may be wealthy, but they're all just folks, old friends, laughing and joking together. The local estate agent even dropped in, trying to sell a little parcel of land. <laughs> And his weight led to some good-natured banter. <laughs> Not many people have their own racing circuit, but Artan Sana does, and it's for go-karts. <laughs> His private go-kart race meeting was a down-home affair. If his old friends appear to show as much respect as friendship, then it was simply the respect due to a world champion. Artan's racing success, particularly when the crowd is concerned with any kind of motorsport, makes him a kind of local squire. A cart had been specially built for Ayrton, and although this meeting was just for fun, he checked it with professional care. It was years since he had driven a go-kart, but he obviously hadn't forgotten how to jump in on the move. Yeah. 
They go too fast for me. <laughs> the kids, the, the, no, no way. They push very hard. They go very, they go pretty fast. Uh, they have also their their engines really going well. They pull very strong. That's fun. I'm gonna try some other go karts. See if I find a better one. <laughs> Like the professional that he is, Barton tried several carts. When I was eight or nine, I already had a proper go-kart, which was big for me. I was so small and light, so my go-kart was fast. I was so light compared to other people. And I used to run with other people, just playing at weekends. And we were outside São Paulo. Suddenly, there were so many people playing there with go-karts that they decided to organize a small race. They asked my father if he would allow me to also participate, because I was eight or nine. There were guys with 20, 25, 18. And my father was a bit scared, of course, and he eventually said OK. So they put all the numbers there, grid position. And I was, because I was the little one, they told me, you take the first one the first one to choose, take the number, and I took number one. So I was on pole position. Uh, and, and that was really my first taste of competition. And I remember I led 35 laps out of 40, because my go-kart was too fast for them. I was big advantage being light. And eventually I was, the last five laps I was second or third, and the guy behind me, who was much faster than me on the corners, could not overtake me on the straight. Eventually, he hit me from the back and I went off the circuit. And uh, so I didn't finish, but uh, it was good fun, good, uh, good memories. Naturally, Artun's friends organized a race and they decided that it was only fair for him to start in last position. He drove cart number 42, his distinctive yellow helmet, identifying him. Inevitably, as the race wore on, he worked his way up through the field. started last and finished third. His father advised the organizer to disqualify Arten for irregularities. <laughs> he was beaten by a beaming small boy who probably never forget the day he beat Arten Senna. <laughs> Uh, 
Platon isn't only interested in real aircraft. Model aircraft have been his hobby for many years. This is from Japan. Ayrton Senna is special. There was a friend of mine in Japan who did it. And um, every year, by the Grand Prix time, uh, they make a plane for me, a model. Uh, they are from Honda Motor Company. They also have a hobby, uh, model flying. And this is the second plane um, they give me in three years. Um, the big one in the wall is the Christian Eagle one. Also was done by them. Beautiful. <coughs> okay. okay. O seu assento deve ter o combustível bom? Trouxe. Ah, deve ter trazido, né? Eles têm usado só para combustível. Aí a gente vai. How did you find doing this when you first started? It's very difficult. I've been doing it for five years and uh, I have uh, damaged and broken many, many models. It's a very special hobby. I, I love it. It's relaxing? When you playing here, yes. When you actually fly, it's not so relaxing because you cannot mistake. You mistake, the model is gone. And sometimes it takes months to build a model. Therefore, you create some love for it because it, you know how hard it is to build one and to damage or destroy one, maybe one second. So, uh, it's some ways it's also a little bit stressing to do it when you fly. But uh, it takes your mind completely away from anything else because it uh, absorbs your mind, your concentration. So it's relaxing in a way to forget any racing cars or interviews, or things like this. <laughs> This is an activity which demands great coordination, concentration, manual dexterity, exceptional sight, all qualities that successful racing drivers must have. Mas eu tive que puxar e não atendeu. Tá com um pouco comando. Eu vou passar aqui na frente, pra ela. Nessa posição mesmo, em cima dos carros. Na altura dos carros. Fica aqui, ó. Unlike the real thing, there's no feel or sensation with a model airplane. It needs a precise intellectual perception. This is never more true than when landing, but you can't land much better than this. <laughs> you, you, you had no, uh, had no engine on that landing? Yeah, 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 the engine stopped on the approach, so I had, uh, was gliding only. But the plane is, is, is marvelous, it flies very beautiful, very smooth, so it's not too difficult to fly uh, compared to other models. Fabio is a less experienced and less skilled model pilot than Ayrton. Flying needed all his concentration. When it came to the landing, Ayrton was ready with a word of advice. And the result pleased everybody. It's doubtful that Artan's racing fans think of him as this 
cheerful, relaxed man. Because his public image is that of a man concentrating hard on an intensely competitive activity. But some schoolboys in Scotland were lucky enough to see another side of Ayrton. Mr. Senna is happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. <clears throat> Mr. Senna, which of your fellow competitors do you admire most and why? One of the greatest drivers of all times is Fangio. Not only because he won five times the world title, uh, but because of his attitude, I had the possibility of meeting with him on different occasions over the past two, three years. He came to some events, some races. I had some moments with him and I, I really like his way of look, his way of approaching certain situations, his concepts about life, his ideas about motor racing. At, this, at his time and today. And uh, for me, he is not only a, a world champion in the circuit, but also a real gentleman outside racing car. <coughs> so for that reason, I, I am a great fan of him and I, I admire him a lot. Sir, how do you personally relate religion to Formula One? Mm. <laughs> I had a very nice experience today when I arrived here in the school, because I was taken to the chapel, that you all know. <laughs> when you talk about religion, it's a touching point, very difficult, easy to be misunderstood. But for me, it's a fact. It's not only by reading the Bible, where you read black and white, but I try hard, as hard as I can, to understand <coughs> Uh, life through God, and that means every day of my life, not only when I am uh, home, but when I'm doing my work too. Sir, when do you hope to retire? Well, I'm only 31 years old. I think I have still a long way to go. Every time I sit in the car, I have a challenge, and that is what gives me the motivation to to drive fast and to dedicate most of my time to my profession, to train hard. And the challenge is just going as fast as I can and be every time ahead and win as many races as I can. My lifestyle puts me in pressure all the time. I have slowly gone to a more private way of life. No wonder that after a long testing day, Arton enjoys a quiet dinner with friends. You've won the world championship twice. You've demonstrated with all your pole positions that you're the fastest driver. Why go on? Because I need it. I need it in first place. It was a kind of a, a choice of life. The thrill I get from driving, the speed, the challenge to succeed, to be the best, to beat records in terms of being successful all the time, the records keep going. And I learn about myself through it. I continuously go further and further, learning about my own limitations, my body limitations, my psychological limitations. I just love winning. I just love racing, I just love the challenge to beat somebody else, and in many occasions even to beat myself. Arton's dream time is the time he spends at his beach house. After the end of the 1990 season, in December and January, he spent 40 uninterrupted days here, replenishing all the physical and emotional resources drained by his working life. Life here has the simplicity that only great wealth can provide. On a day when the weather is dull, Arton simply takes his helicopter from its concealment in the trees. A few short minutes away is a large uninhabited island. On the other side of the island's mountains, the sun is usually shining.
Arton Senna must be one of the world's most eligible bachelors, so you wouldn't expect him to be short of women friends. My lifestyle is very particular and therefore makes it very difficult to have um, stable relationships with particularly women because you're traveling too much, you're away too much, especially when you're Brazilian. And uh, when I find the right woman at the right time, it's gonna happen. This island is a special place for Alton and holds one very special memory for him. Well, I come here late in the afternoon. It was a beautiful end of the day. Uh, no cloud, just the sun going down. The beach was completely clean and there wasn't a single footprint in it. And I run, go to the end of it, and when I turn, on the way back. I realized that the whole of this was here for me. It was nobody else, nothing else. And uh, it was such a, a feeling of peace suddenly, and a, such a strong feeling of healthy, that I run harder and harder, stronger and strong. And still, I felt so good, and I remember I ran for an hour in the soft sand, which is hard. But my vision was so good, was such a good feeling that it kept my butt going. And um, the, the fact that I, I could only see my, my own footprint as I was going back and forwards was an uh, amazing feeling, like it uh, was a gift. But from the outside, it, it looks as if you have a very special life. Does it seem that way to you? I'm sure of it. First of all, few people in life have the opportunity to do what they want to do and to have their profession, what was their hobby. Secondly, to be successful in the activity that we are, very few. To have come from nowhere to where I am today, still with 30 years old, is, it's a great achievement. And uh, not only that, to be healthy, strong, and still with a long way to go, with so much still to learn and achieve. Um, it's, it's very unique to have uh, a good family in the modern days where divorces and things like this are so common. Uh, so our main problems for sure are that big when you look, generally speaking, to other people's life. And therefore, and even so, they are big to us because they are the only ones we have. So I think I am very fortunate for that. I have won 15, 16 races. But um, and been amongst those, some beautiful wins. But I always believe my best one is still to come. And that's what keeps me going. Is the, the, feeling that the best is still to happen. I believe the important thing is to be in peace with yourself. Artin Senna was a very unusual person. At times he had an almost mystical quality, as if there was more to him than you could see and touch. It's very rare in life that you meet anybody like that, and if you do, you'll never forget them. I will certainly never forget Ayrton Senna.